an Australian anti-aircraft gunner following a dogfight. To the British, flying high above the mud and misery of the trenches, the air war was a place for gentlemen. After German air race Oswald Birke was killed in an air battle, a unit of the Royal Flying Corps flew across enemy lines and dropped a wreath that read, to the memory of Captain Birke, our brave and chivalrous foe. The Great War spurred on aeronautical development and fueled a boom in aeroplane manufacture. But the end of the war saw a huge drop in aircraft production in the United States, with the annual figure dropping from 14,000 in 1918 to 263 in 1922. The American people wanted to forget everything relating to war, and more than 100,000 combat pilots were demobilized. Other countries were more gradual in phasing out their military expenditure. The French government continued to commission aircraft and used the surplus to subsidize the new field of commercial aviation. Sopwith joined Australian Harry Hawker to form the H.G. Hawker Engineering Company, which manufactured military aircraft including the Fury, the Hart and the, and the Nimrod. Civil flying resumed in 1919 and passenger services were established for short routes within Europe and America, usually made up of ex-military aeroplanes flown by ex-military pilots. Conditions were far from luxurious, and one carrier, Aircraft Transport and Travel, issued passengers with thick coats, helmets, goggles and gloves, and sometimes hot water bottles. In the early 1920s, the advent of large aircraft carriers brought new opportunities for fighter aircraft. At the beginning of the war, Britain's Royal Navy had converted four cross-channel steamers into seaplane carriers. However, taking off and landing at sea proved to be a tricky business, impossible except in perfect conditions. On October the 17th, 1922, Lieutenant Virgil C. Griffin took off in a Vought VE-7 biplane from the Langley's decks launching the U.S. Navy into a new era. The development of the Pratt & Whitney Wasp engine in the mid-1920s was a major step forward for American aircraft. A nine-cylinder radial of first 400, then 600 horsepower, the Wasp improved the maneuverability and speed and rate of climb of Army and Navy aircraft. The interwar years saw the Germans secretly build up their air force, as the Treaty of Versailles had banned the losers of the First World War from rearming. The German air force was known as the Luftwaffe, and its first fighters were traditional fabric-covered biplanes. At first, pilots were convinced that only biplanes with their open cockpits and fast turning speeds could be effective fighters. But the development of the Messerschmitt Bf 109 put paid to that theory. The BF-109 featured an all-metal stressed skin and a slim fuselage with a sideways hinged cockpit canopy. It first saw active service during the Spanish Civil War, serving as a highly effective fighter bomber and remained in production throughout the Second World War. We are now in possession of one of William Messerschmitt's latest models. This is the ME-109F, Germany's very newest fighter plane. The Nazi pilot, a certain Captain Pingel, a Prussian officer who wears corsets and claims to have destroyed 22 British aircraft thought he could outwit the RAF gunners, but ended up in a forced landing near St. Margaret's Bay. As a result of his swollen headedness, all the closely guarded secrets of the new plane are disclosed to our research experts. Slap Happy Herman will be cross. As the clouds of war gathered over Europe in the late 1930s, Britain's Hawker Aircraft Company produced its own exceptional fighter the Hawker Hurricane. A monoplane development of the single-seat interceptor fighter, the Hawker Fury, the Hurricane entered service in late 1937 and swiftly proved indispensable against German bombers when hostilities broke out two years later. The Hurricane was built around Rolls-Royce's Merlin engine, a liquid-cooled V12 cylinder. Its cockpit was placed high in the fuselage to give the pilot good visibility and the aircraft was armed with 12.303-inch Browning machine guns. 
When the first Luftwaffe bombers dropped their deadly nighttime payloads over southern England in late 1940, the British had no answer. On the 15th of November, after Coventry was attacked, the air minister wrote to the prime minister, last night 300 German aircraft converged on a known target. 100 fighters were airborne, yet the only casualty is claimed neither by the fighters nor by the guns. It wasn't until its scientists perfected radar operations that Britain made headway in the Battle of Britain. The concept of using radio waves to identify aircraft in flight had been around for some time, but the British were the first to set up radar stations. Positioned along the southern and eastern coasts of Britain, they scanned the skies for Luftwaffe bombers, pinpointing them even in poor weather and darkness. Packs of fighters were then launched into attack with the advantage of knowing the precise position of their targets. Among these fighters were 20 squadrons of Supermarine Spitfires. A single-seater monoplane, the thin cross-section on its elliptical wing enabled it to reach higher speeds than its contemporaries. It was the only Allied airplane to serve out the whole war. Like the Hurricane, the Spitfire was armed with eight Browning .303 caliber machine guns and powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Together, the two aircraft were incomparable. But their strategic advantage owed more to radar than aircraft design. Instead of flying blind sorties in the hope of spotting enemy planes, the Battle of Britain fighters could rest comfortably on the ground until the radar found its target. Then it was a mad scramble as pilots ran to their aeroplanes and headed into the sky but it was a dangerous game. Britain's pilots included many from Commonwealth countries, as well as those who escaped before Hitler cast his net over Eastern Europe. The fighter tactics adopted before the air war started proved costly, as the rigid formations were predicated on attack from bombers, not escort fighters. The British were fighting for their lives, with Germany poised to invade under Operation Sea Lion as soon as its bombers cowed the British people. But they were a people who refused to be cowed, and autumn 1940 saw Fighter Command finally gain the ascendancy. Germany was bombing British cities day and night. The first official record of aerial combat in the sky. In a moment you will see what our pilots see in action. There in front is a German and we're overhauling him. Streaks on the screen are the tracer bullets from our fighter. There's the first hit. And there he goes, on fire and down to destruction. So Fighter Command put radar-equipped night fighters into the field to pick off the night bombers. Presenting our latest and most heavily armed fighter planes, Bristol Bowfighters. Among them, Those the Bristol Type 156 Bowfighter. The bow was heavy and slow, rushed off the assembly line to bolster the Air Force. But it was still faster than the lumbering German bombers in its sights. With four 20mm cannons mounted in the lower fuselage to allow radar antennae to be fitted, the bow had a high success rate against its adversaries. After the Battle of Britain, bows were redeployed to the North African and Mediterranean theatres of war, where they enjoyed similar successes. The North Coats strike wing used bow fighters to suppress anti-aircraft flak, while turbo fighters attacked ship convoys closer to the ocean. Ten guns, enough to blast any enemy machine out of the skies. Sunset and the work of our night fighter pilots. The Bolton Paul Defiant was another night fighter set against the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain. The two seater fighter entered service in 1939 and initially looked set to match its cousins, the Spitfire and the Hurricane. However, while the Defiant was faster than the Spitfire, it had no forward firepower, instead, relying on the hydraulically operated dorsal turret. At first, this was to its advantage, as the Germans were not expecting an aeroplane that fired from the rear. The Defiant collected the scalps of numerous bombers and Bf 109s. But once the Luftwaffe wised up, the Defiant was easy prey. 